Hey, we did it. We four episodes, man. We need to figure out a name for this podcast though before we get to episode five. Okay. Ideas? Thomas and Justin save podcasting. Justin breaks the internet. I do that every day. I'm a filmmaker. I'm a scientist. And we're two friends who've made movies together. And launched a company together. And we lost our money. And our identity. But we are finding ourselves again. And this is our podcast. This is it. Welcome. In this episode, we demystify our respective jobs as a scientist and as a film director. I talk about working with ramen spectroscopy at Kaiser. Hold on. You mean you don't sell ramen noodles at Kroger? See, I knew your eyes were glazing over the whole time I was talking. You cooked ramen so well. I learned that at work. Ramen noodle spectroscopy. And I talk about the job of a film director. But first, we chat a little bit about the COVID vaccine. And we should note that our conversation about COVID was recorded a few weeks ago when numbers were surging. Thankfully, they're trending down at the moment. And there's a new CDC guidance that gets towards one of the topics that I bring up. So take that into account as you listen to our conversation. All that and more on episode four. You remember that email I sent in like February of 2020? Where, you know, it was like, what's the, what's all this then with this COVID? And I was like, look, I think COVID, it's it's worse than the flu. It's very serious. But I, I feel like everyone's going to get on board. We're going to wear masks and we will knock this thing out by fall. And, you know, I, I, I think I even said in the email, you should go back and look. I think I said, there's a good chance that uh, I might embarrass myself by putting this, <laughs> by writing this down. But I believe it. Well, we... You know, because we were trying to make a film to shoot in May. So early March or February, when this was clearly happening overseas and it was starting to happen in the U.S., you were the first probably to raise the issue of, hey, we should start having contingency conversations about this shoot. And then, you know, in March, when things were starting to shut down, we just had, I, I had no, lay people like me had no handle on the timeline of this, but you said something even then, like, I know by May, this, this is going to be worse. And then by fall, like you had such a handle on the long-term ramifications that were coming that I just remember hearing them. I'm just like, there's no way, surely, (laughs) surely this will all blow over by, by spring. Maybe we'll push our film by a month, maybe two. And now here we are almost, a year later from those conversations. And I mean, it's worse than ever. (laughs) The the pandemic's worse than ever. I do. I remember feeling like a maniac in February and March because I was wearing a mask back then and I would go into grocery stores and there was nobody wearing a mask and it wasn't that bad back then. Honestly, you didn't really need one back then, but you were leading by example. Well, and the fact that there was because of fear in the professional science and medical community, they were misinforming the general population about masks. And I feel like it came back to bite them in the ass so hard. Um, all of us, I guess, in the ass so hard. I, I feel the same way, honestly, right now about the way that a lot of professional people are talking about the vaccine, I think is also going to come back and bite us in the ass. How so? I was about to ask you. So, you know, you were right about so much a year ago. What What's your sense for 2021 and this pandemic? The vaccines are incredible. And if you look at the metrics of like other vaccines, uh, like the influenza vaccine, you know, usually like 70% effective, right? And that is 70% effective. It's actually four vaccine, three or four vaccines in there. And you put all those together and it's still only 70% effective. This is a vaccine that, you know, these are 95 plus percent effective. That's like, you know, eradication of a disease le- level, right? Like polio vaccine level of, of efficacy. Um, so they're incredible. And I don't think we're kind of, we're really playing up the, you know, the nature of how good these are, but also they're saying things like, oh, well, we don't know yet for sure if, you know, you get this vaccine, if you can still be a carrier. And so like, let's not change our behavior and all that kind of stuff. But the reality is there aren't any other vaccines that have that nature to them, right? That that you can still be a carrier. Like you either get it or you don't. So they're, what they're saying is we can't rule this out despite the fact that we've never seen this before. It's like saying, well, we don't know for sure that getting this vaccine won't make it 10 times worse and cause mutations that turn you into a mutant. Um, No, we don't know that. But like, why would we have any reason to think that? So I believe that they're telling people that they need to like, don't change your behavior. And, you know, because there is a fear that because of the time that it's going to take for this rollout, people will start changing their behavior 
because they're vaccinated, but then people around them will see this and be like, oh, okay, I can stop wearing a mask, not realizing that uh, that other person is vaccinated. And So you need a critical uh, mass of the population to be immune before you can really roll back the behavior protocols. Right. And, and that is, it's a, it's a weird thing to think like, well, I'm vaccinated, but I'm still supposed to wear a mask. Right. Right. But it, it, that is a, it's sort of a societal cultural thing. Like if you stop wearing it, then other people are going to think that it's okay. And there will be less of a social pressure to wear them. But instead of just saying that to people who are being vaccinated, they are telling people that maybe you could still be a carrier, which is making people think that it's not very effective. And so anyone who was already on the fringe of, I don't, not really a big fan of vaccines, or I'm not sure that this vaccine works, is pushing them further into that category. And yeah, you need a critical mass. The, the idea of herd immunity, I mean, you know, you need like 80, 90, I don't know the exact numbers. I'm not an epidemiologist. I just like epidemiology and know it's a small amount. But you really need a very high percentage of the population to protect that small percentage that is not inoculated. I will qualify all the things that I'm saying by, you know, of course, I am not, I don't work for the NIH. I don't have that level of credentialed information, but I am a scientist. I, you know, I studied, my degree was not in epidemiology from Johns Hopkins, but I did study that there. And uh, it's something that I'm interested in. I keep up with it on a regular basis. My wife is currently in the healthcare field. I work in drug development. Um, I, I'm in biologics for, for many years, and so I'm familiar with FDA protocols and getting a drug from discovery to market. I've done, I've gone through that entire process start to finish. So I, I, I know more about it than maybe your average person, but I am not, uh, I'm not an Anthony Fauci, for example. So I would put my level, you know, obviously I, I'm not a professional in that specific field, but I know a bit about it. I know a guy who's an EMT, he's a medical professional. And he didn't want to get one right now. He's not anti-vaccination by any means, but there was a little bit of apprehension about how quickly it came to market and missing some of the potential steps of other vaccinations and having the, you know, benefit of time and a sample size and all of that. And I'm curious what, uh, I'm curious the response to that with, with this. I mean, I, obviously they, they brought it to market faster. And to my knowledge, they didn't skip important benchmarks or important parts that, you know, have it be FDA approved, but I don't really know the details of it. What are those? So it it is a new kind of vaccine because we've never had a vaccine for something that, you know, for for COVID-19. But you have to remember that we get vaccines for influenza new every year. And so we, you know, those typically take 12 to 18 months to develop. It, it's very fast, but it's also because it is following an established route that, you know, sort of well-worn, right? But there isn't one of those for COVID-19, and maybe there will be going forward. So I will say that, yes, it was very quick to market. I guess, does that speed give you it not enough apprehension to not get the vaccine? But is there any apprehension that is warranted by virtue of how quickly it's come to market? I think that it's, it's a valid concern. My, my wife, being midwife, she was in the first wave of vaccinations, and she we had similar conversations. She's like, I don't like the idea that we are being experimented on is kind of what it feels like because we are the the front line, and so they're sort of getting data from us. And I was like, yeah, I, I get that. Um, but the, it's not as – my understanding of the process is not that those steps have been completely eliminated. They are still ongoing. This is a provisional um, – the, the FDA has given it provisional status, which means that those benchmarks still need to be hit. They are just going to approve it beforehand because of the necessity. So there is still an expectation that they will meet those benchmarks. And the, the initial data does didn't rise to those levels in terms of the volume, but it did rise to those levels in terms of how good it was. So, you know, you look at the numbers of people that, have, that, that it was tested on in the tens of thousands and how you know how effective it was it is pretty impressive it's just that there is a high bar for of safety and, and rightly so that the fda requires and that's one of the reasons that drug development is so expensive is because you have to do these all these phases of clinical trials that cost literal billions of dollars and in this case it was fast tracked and so that is uh it's but they are still going to be required to do a lot of the, that work good segue uh to what we wanted to sort of unpack, which is demystifying 
the jobs each of us does. Uh, me as a writer director and Justin as a scientist. And I will confess, having known Justin for fifteen years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So sometimes I'm I'm not I'm like, what is what do you actually do? Um, and I know that work has changed over the years. So let me maybe prompt you when 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 we quit our day jobs and started bad theology, you were in biotech. Um, and now you do something very different. So I'm curious of of what you what you did then, what you do now. So maybe start with the biotech world. What did it look like to be a, a scientist in the biotech field? What did you actually do? You know, the actual hands-on part of it, it was, you know, day-to-day. I worked in biologic development. And so biologic is different than small molecule in the way that interferon is different than aspirin. Aspirin is a is a chemical compound that you can synthesize chemically. Something like interferon um, is, is a is a macromolecule is a protein that has that we can't synthesize chemically we have to actually have cells make it for us and so that's why it's called cell culture it's i mean it's kind of a weird thing but essentially what you do is you take these cells and in the the, what, the most common one is we call them cho cells because cho cho is less weird to talk about than chinese hamster ovary which is what cho stands for and so essentially you take these cells that have been programmed to produce a protein that you want in large quantities and you put it into a broth uh, that it consumes to create protein and it grows and you put them in some, something called a bioreactor. It stirs it. It adds oxygen. It's, you know, it's at the right temperature. So they grow and produce the protein. And then you essentially separate the protein from the cells and all the other debris. And now you have your drug product. Is what you just described – a day long process, a week long process, a year long process. It so if it's bacterial, it can be a day a day long. If you're using a bacterial vector, if you're using mammalian like Cho or HEK, which is um, another cell line that's commonly used as a human derived cell line, those are more typically one to two weeks for what's called a batch process, or even longer for a perfusion or continuous process. So. But the day-to-day is you are monitoring these bioreactors. So you're designing experiments. You will do something called inoculation. That's where you take a little tiny amount of cells and put them into a large volume to start the growing process. Um, You can be feeding, which is where you just essentially do some calculations and pump in liquid nutrients into these bioreactors. It's very matrix at this point. I mean, you know, we're like hanging bags and tubes everywhere. And I think I've talked about earlier, the plumbing part of it, right? I mean, you are looking for leaks in these big arrays of stainless steel uh, piping. Yeah, describe your work environment. Like what what, what – are you going into a vanilla office and spending a lot of time in front of a computer? Or are you put on a lab coat and go into a big room with industrial machinery? Well, did you ever, do, you, do you remember the, the Resident Evil film, kind of the first one in the series franchise with Mia Jovovich? Yeah. Yeah, not it, enough to really. I mean, use but the basic point. idea is like that there was this hive, and you sort of went in, and there was like uh, cubicles and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if I see, I played the game. I don't know if I seen the movie. Anyway, it, the, it's like yeah, I would go in. I had a, a cubicle, which then became an open concept office, which I hated. Um, and I would sit there and I would do data analysis and all that kind of stuff. And then I would go over and I'd put a white lab coat on, and um, we had you know positive pressure rooms. I'd hit the roll up door and go in, and um, and then I was in there, and I had there was analytical equipment on the you know one side of the room and then there was all of these uh stainless steel bioreactors so we had 350 liters we had a uh, thousand liter you know all these big reactors with pipes everywhere and uh a bunch of those it, what, is it, what was it called we, you know the floor was that lab grade floor material like a polymer floor and so it was just and there were a lot of dirty stinky days i mean especially a harvest day when you would empty these bioreactors and it would just smell so bad and it was terrible. Uh, but then at the end of the day, you've got, you know, and I was in development, so we were trying to make better processes that produced better proteins that were safer, that produced more of it. So it was easier to make. And that was my main part when I was in development. And I, I worked with an analytical technology, which is now my, my main focus. And that's called Raman spectroscopy is essentially what, and I, I can talk more about that later, but you just mentioned Raman spectroscopy. And I think it's worth noting that you have innovated advances within your field 
to the degree that you've received patents and publications in your name because of these innovations to the best you can. I mean, you were able to explain it to me and it was really fascinating. Explain what you did and what was really novel to the biotech world. Raman is typically considered an analytical chemistry technique. Named after a person. It is named after a person. Um, George, uh, Mr. Raman. <laughs> Mr. Raman. It's Chandrash, Ch- Chandrasekhar Raman, an Indian physicist in the early 20th century. So he actually, it's one of the things that a lot of people, they feel intimidated if they've never heard of it, or maybe they remember it from school, if they were in any kind of science discipline. It feels intimidating because, you know, use words like analytical chemistry or Raman is actually a quantum mechanical phenomenon. And so anytime you add quantum mechanical to something, people are like, oh God, it's either they think, ooh, that's fancy, or they think that's, I don't want to hear about it. It's too complicated. But it's actually really simple. I mean, he discovered it in 1928 with his naked eye. He saw something and I mean, he ended up winning the Nobel Prize for it. But I mean, so like if he could see it with his naked eye and, you know, it can't be that complicated. Um, it is the language we use, I think, that makes it feel intimidating. Are you familiar with the idea of the wave particle duality? That's something that we've talked about, right? Or is, maybe not. Is it something that you're familiar with outside of our relationship? Yes. How, for instance, something like light is both a wave and a particle. Exactly. And it actually applies to all particles. Um, it, it's harder to observe the larger you get, but it does apply to all particles. So in the case of photons, they can interact with chemical bonds, which, you know, is or I should say any kind of electron state. So even if it's a single atom, it can interact with that. So the photon will act like a particle and it will go in and and raise things to these uh, temporary excited states. Have you ever wondered how standing in the sun makes your skin feel warm, despite the fact that that light spent eight minutes in the in the Hmm. cold vacuum of space? Oh, interesting. No, I... Why is why is space not warm? Yeah, I've never... That's never occurred to me. Like, how, why hasn't it cooled down the sun photons? Or, or Yeah, like, why, how, how is it that the photons get here and then make me feel warm or warm up our planet? Mm, I haven't thought about that. Or, I mean, or why is the sky blue? I mean, <laughs> these are things that are addressed by this sort of, like, light. So, in the case of your skin, the way that it works is those photons, they go in and they interact with the chemical bonds in your uh, in your skin... And some of the energy is absorbed and is then dissipated in the form of, of heat. Or in the case of, you know, the sky being blue, the light comes through and there's a different kind of scattering. It's called Rayleigh scattering, which I don't need to necessarily get into, but it scatters the light. And because it scatters blue light most, you know, or shorter wavelengths, I should say, most efficiently, the light that actually makes it down to our eyeballs is blue. In the case of Raman spectroscopy, the light goes in and temporarily excites the the these bonds and the chemicals each chemical bond has a certain energy and they we, you can call it the, the vibrational mode or but essentially what it is is it's almost like tetris each kind of bond has a specific amount of energy that will fit neatly into that bond and it's different for everything so if it's like two carbons it fit the, the amount of energy that fits into that space is different than if it's a carbon and an oxygen and so what you can do is you can take laser light, since all those photons are the same color, and which means they're the same energy, you shine it into something, and it will absorb a certain amount of that light, or the energy from that light, and then it will shoot those photons back out, but it will change the color, and therefore the energy. So we can measure that change in color, that even tiny, tiny changes in colors, like you know less than a, than a single um, nanometer of, of wavelength, and we can measure that change in color, and then that tells us what that bond is. And you do that a few quintillion times, you know, per second or minute or whatever, you know, the math works out to be. And all of a sudden you can see what is inside of the container. Is it gasoline or is it um, ethane or, you know, what, what are the molecules that are in there? And you add them up and you can understand what it is. So that is the basic understanding of what it is. It's something that allows you to to quantify chemical bonds. And when you put those together, you can figure out what the thing is that you're looking at. And no one had applied Raman spectroscopy to the biotech field, at least in the way you did. Why was that needed? Why was there a purpose in applying this measuring technique to what you were doing in the lab? So I, I will say, I was not the first person to to publish. And there were other people that were you know, working towards this. I just kind of jumped in you know, both feet and my company got behind me. And so we moved really, really quickly. And that's what allowed us to patent and publish uh, 
quite a few things. And there are a lot of things that we, the, the lawyers would not let us patent or publish because they wanted to keep them as trade secrets. But we were very happily uh, surprised when it essentially doubled the output of the, of the process. So right off the bat, it like cut the cost almost in half. It's not truly quite in half. It was about reduced it by about 40%. So now all of a sudden you've got this drug in development that, you know, you can make for way cheaper. You, you innovated a way to be more efficient with the way you measured what you were studying and the output to the tune of what, like what did it, what, what, what in real terms that saved your company? Well, so in the first year of its implementation, it saved us about $200 million. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I know. So now working on the other side of all the labs and the companies that would utilize this equipment, you work for the company that sells it. And do you help installations? Are you troubleshooting with other scientists as they're trying to figure it out? Are you just, are you more internal with the company and just collating all of the data and information and finding ways to make to improve the product? You mentioned it a little bit in our first episode, you know, each day could look different and it's part of the reason why you like it. I still don't quite have a handle on the specificity of what you do. Yeah. So a certain amount of my time is spent on improving the technology, pushing it forward. And this is like working towards new patents, completely changing the, the paradigm of ramen. That's part of my, uh, my workload. There's a, a much larger part of it that is spent working with customers who essentially, again, there's a certain amount of, of assumption of innovation and gung-ho wild westness in these industries. But the truth is, is that a lot of scientists and engineers are nervous about putting themselves on the line by backing something, even if it would have a great improvement. And I can point to the papers and I can point to the, all of these presentations and, and uh, all this information, and that's not necessarily enough to convince them. And so there's a lot of time spent helping them understand developing experiments so that they can try it and prove it to themselves and to their management that it's going to work. And it, partly because this is not a plug and play thing. It takes, you know, you've got to adapt it so that it works for your process. There's also a significant amount of data analysis that is required that is that not everybody knows how to do. It's called multivariate data analysis. And it's when you're working with giant data sets, you know, in other industries, people call it big data. That's what we do as well. And so that is required. And so I train people on that. Sometimes I actually, I just do the, the math for them. Um, and then, you know, time to time I'll do an installation. That's why I travel overseas or I train people hands-on training and, so some of the more interesting aspects of it are the projects that I get to work on. So getting to work with companies, I mean, I, I'm working with um, the, some of the companies that are doing COVID vaccines and helping them get that up and running faster, seeing that from the inside, people that were working on Ebola vaccines and actually helping them m to make a process where they could change specific parameters of their of the output uh, by using a technology that allows them to know in real time what's happening. And so those are some of the things that are the, the more interesting components that are, you know, it's easier to point to that as a fun outcome as opposed to, well, look at this big data set that I made. But ultimately, that's what it boils down to is that we are making, we're trying to help people make better products, safer, faster, more efficiently. Do you have aspirations for where you want to go in your career or things you want to achieve as it relates to being a scientist? Like, or do you even think that way? Are you like... I wish I could be doing this or I want to, you know, grow towards this. I want to win a Nobel prize. I want to get five more patents. Do you have sort of like aspirations or dreams or ambitions or am I the ambitious one? Well, I, I mean, right off the bat, like I winning a Nobel prize is always something I thought would be really cool as a kid. As I learned about some of the Nobel prize winners that I went on to look up like, you know, Niels Bohr and uh, Max Planck and all these people who are just geniuses. And that, that is, I am not at that level. Like I, I'm not smart enough to win a Nobel Prize, and I'm not in the right field. You really need to be in like deep academic research for that. But as far as aspirations, I will say that the last five years have taught me to tone down my aspirations. And so, like right now, I'm just really enjoying the job that I have and its freedom and its flexibility. While also there is a, a project that I started working on that I still think would be a great innovation in the field, and I started working on it um, with my PhD advisor years ago, and it was too applied. For, for his taste, you know, they really want the theoretical stuff. And this was a hard applied, like we we're going to have to build, we we're going to have to work with a different department to actually build new materials uh, that didn't exist. 
I still want to do that. And my company is interested and I'm currently working on the, the writing up the patent that once filed, then they would approve the, uh, the actual, the demo of it, which is funny. You typically patent things before you've proven that they work, uh, which is strange. My kids to varying degrees, they all want to do some aspect of what I do, not necessarily film, but you know, entrepreneurial working from yourself. So I'm, I'm, I'm clearly influencing my kids in the trajectory they want, at least now. Do your kids have any interest in this in the science industry? Yeah, my my daughter has a very rapid grasp of science. Uh, we actually did a raw for her science fair project uh, two years ago. We did Raman spectroscopy. I have a lot of the equipment. I have a lab not far from my house. That's my own personal lab, and I have the equipment there. And so she wanted to like use Raman spectroscopy to understand differences between different kinds of paint. And so we did that, and it was uh, it's funny. She she really understood. It. I gave her a very low level understanding of what Raman is. Like we shine light at it, change you know. Like we all understand how color works, right? You sh- it's the light that bounces back, and you know, based on the conversation we just had about absorption and stuff, maybe you can have a better understanding of what what is actually happened when we say that light bounces off of things. But so we talked about that, and we used Raman to do it. And I feel like she understood, um, but then but nobody in her science for committee, everyone was like, "Your dad did this," and I was like, "Die, nah, she did it." Oh, and uh, they didn't, they didn't say that, but I could see it in their eyes. I was like, I gave her the equipment. I explained to her and I let her do it. And, um, but they, they, she still got, uh, you know, there was bef- in the ages before they actually give prizes, right? Like everybody gets a ribbon, <laughs> um, until you're in third grade. Uh, so she, but I think that she really wants to be an artist, but who knows? Like, you know, I don't want to pressure them in, to deciding now, but she is an incredible artist and, you know, and my son, he is also really intelligent. He's just has a harder time focusing on things. So he, I don't really know where he's going to end up. They also don't see me do this job, the the science job, as much as they see me do the other job. Like my, my kids thought I was a professional rock climber, you know, until I was, until my daughter was like six. She told her teacher that, and her teacher was like, so you're a professional rock climber. I was like, what? No, I just rock climb at the gym sometimes. <laughs> and that's, that's true. Like our children... They'll only, you know, what they see. Yeah, it's just nebulous until they see something tactile. Good thing I've made a lot of shorts that are appropriate yeah, for my kids. They, couldn't, they, they can't watch. They can't watch the features at least. Uh, yeah, my kids have seen the premise preview and they really want to watch it. Yeah. I'm like, I don't think so. Yeah. Some, I can't, Minor premise, sorry. I can't wait till my kids are of age to just watch anything because I feel like a whole new level of our bonding will emerge. Stay with us as we continue our discussion on what we do, and Thomas dives into the job of film director. And after that, Justin gives one doozy of a book recommendation that you won't want to miss. I wish that I could say the same about Thomas's recommendation. Hey, everyone needs coffee, and these are trying times. Don't go anywhere. Thomas, you... So we, we've talked about writing, and I understand writing to a certain degree, not especially screenwriting. I'm not, I'm not great at it. There are a lot of nuances that I don't understand, but directing is something that I feel like the, I, I think I've made this, this connection. The closest thing I can connect it to is something that I have more experience with, but still no understanding of. And that is somebody who's conducting an orchestra. I still don't know how, like the vision or anything like that, but what all is part of directing? Cause when we did fair, that, that is not a typical experience. I, I feel like you can say that, but that was my experience of what a director does. But you were also producing and acting and, you know, doing all of these other things that maybe are not part of like what a pure directorial role, like you're hired to direct, you're not a writer. And I, I think disentangling that is hard because even in Minor Premise, Eric was directing it, but he was also a writer. And he was also very much involved in all of these other decisions. And so I don't know if you were could take it down to an academic sense. What is the goal of a director? What roles are they? And I know not that you are the decider of, you know, what is the right thing for a director, but what, is there any kind of consensus of like what that looks like? Well, that's a good question. Is there a consensus? I think to some degree, I think being a director in the independent film space is different than being a director in the studio film space. It's certainly different than being a director in the television space. As someone who has largely produced his own stuff, I've only had the experience of just being a director, which is a creative job. A producer is a administrative job. I've only had the benefit of just being a create a director in a project 
two, maybe three times out of, you know, several hundred productions. And they were commercials. You know, they weren't even short films. They weren't features. Certainly they were commercials. And it was the best, most stress-free experience because all of the stuff I was used to doing as a producer was handled. But indie directors are often producing, which really is to say lifting the rocks up the mountain. The director would just be saying, here's the kind of rock I want and here's where I want it to go. <laughs> the producers, the crew, they do the lifting. Obviously, there's a certain amount of that that is a function of budgetary constraints and independent film needs a champion, right? Like it's not been, been just greenlit, like typically they're being internally greenlit a little bit at a time. But do you think that there's something about the psyche of an independent filmmaker that they want that control more? Or do you think being an independent filmmaker breeds the, the, does the love for that control more? Again, I don't have, I don't have a lot of experience outside of independent f directors, but that is my experience. They seem to like that, the level of control more. I can't, I don't know if I can speak to the, the level of control. I feel like every director is a controller, is someone who likes to be in control. Having that desire to be in control is actually what makes a good director because the Coen brothers call directing tone management. It's like the two, you know, if you can boil it down to two words, tone management, that's what the Coen brothers say. And that is a great distillation of the director. Um, and so in order to manage tone, so you have your story, let's assume that a script is written by the writer. Then let's assume that a production is now assembled around that script head by the producer or the studio. And now they need a director, the one to manage the tone. Now, typically that director will get vision for the tone. Like I can take a script and I can push this towards absurdity or towards comedy or towards drama. Uh, without even rewriting thing, I can push the tone a certain way because I have a take on here's how I feel like is the right way to communicate this. And then because a film is full of so many different disciplines and technicians and artisans, you need one person at the top who's ultimately answering the questions, the thousand different questions that have come up during production on a daily basis. Everything from the color of a piece of set, a prop, a wardrobe, casting someone, the location, all of that needs to be coalesced through a singular vision in order for cohesion to happen, in order for a consistent tone to be achieved at. Now, traditionally in the studio system, that singular vision could have been in a producer who would have an idea. They'd hire a writer, then they'd hire a director. And in those cases, which is still very much like television is today, the director, it's an artistic job, but it's, it's, they're, they're more of, um, you know, a captain of a ship rather than the admiral of the whole fleet. So getting back to this idea of the independent film, it, it is, you know, it, it really, it really exploded in the nineties with, you know, Spike Lee and Tarantino and Steven Soderbergh and the very early nineties when indie film really became a thing. Part of it had to do with the accessibility of equipment. It was still film back then, but people could raise a couple hundred grand and go shoot their own films. So when you have artists who just want to make a movie, typically that's coming from a place of inspiration or passion project. And the inevitability is that they just go out and do it themselves. So then it becomes this amalgam of a, of a writer, director, producer, all kind of doing it together, which is how FAIR functioned. I was doing all of those jobs sort of simultaneously. And I think that's a product of indie film, not just because indie film attracts control freak artists, and it does, but in a way, there's always control freak artists. And a lot of them in the past, they just, they weren't promoted through the ranks of the studio system to become the directors and the writers and the producers. But now when the industry has been very decentralized, you know, going back 30 years, really to the beginning of, you know, American indie film. And before that, the French New Wave, where people like Jean-Luc Godard were just going out and making their movie. It was really, it was artists that didn't have the barrier of entry. They could just go make their film. But even today, in the word independent film has become a loose term because something could technically not be independent. Or we could, well, what do you mean by independent? It's certainly independent of a distributor. It doesn't yet have distribution. 
And that's kind of the simplest thing uh, independent means. But sometimes it can still have a studio and there could be a big studio that has raised $20 million to go make your independent film. But even where the technicality of where independent starts or stops, there's still this idea of the spirit of independent film, which is an artist who's got an idea, who just wants to make something that's bold and who's able to do it on a very small scale that's achievable. And that's always, almost always going to mean that director is also producing because often those ideas are personal. So they inevitably know where it's going to be shot, you know, and the logistics of location scouting is something the producer oversees, but the director is going to have a hand in that or the way it's written. But to really drill down on the job of the director, it's the tone manager. It's the creative controller. It's the one funnel that every other decision must go through for the purpose of cohesion, clarity, and ultimately the vision. And unfair, it was so small. We had almost no crew. There was not a lot of disparate parts that had to come together towards the funnel of me and my mind and my vision. But but my desire isn't to keep doing that. I, I really do seek and crave a better division of labor where the burden of producing is really carried by other people and I can just be creative. Making a film, it's very, there's phases. There's the writing phase or the development phase. I mean, a writer is writing, but other people are doing things during that development phase where the idea turns into a document that then goes into pre-production and that document turns into a plan. And then that plan becomes executed during production, which is the shortest phase of it all, but obviously where everything is captured with actors and cameras. And there's post-production where what you've captured is now edited into the finished product. It's a visual medium, but it's it's a projected visual medium, meaning it's not, you know, you're, you're watching something that is put together after the fact. So the director is leading the creative charge at each phase. And it very much can look like a conductor during shooting because you've got 50 different people on set, all with a very defined division of labor, a, a, a strong hierarchy that's really been established and evolved over time. And, and it's very efficient. If you're an efficiency nerd like I am, a film set can be the most fun kind of environment because there's so much going on and in good ones that are well run, everything's max efficiency where people know exactly what they're doing. You're not overseeing all those people. You're just overseeing a few key people because they've got, you know, all the people under them, but they're all coming to you with a hundred questions every five minutes. And you know how to answer those questions because you have a handle on the tone or the larger vision. An architect and a general contractor are, is, a, is another analogy I use a lot. The architect, so that's a creative job. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm, someone's asked me to build this thing, and here's what I want to do. Here's my vision for this building, how it should function, then the actual document, and then the general contractor executes that. A general contractor in this analogy would be the producer who's sort of taking the vision and then executing it. And the GC is is hiring the crew. He's got the timeline. He's dealing with the insurance, with the money. but And the architect doesn't have to deal with any of that. So in a, in a pure, in an environment where a director is only directing, they don't even know the details about the insurance. They don't even know the budget. Because they've hired people they trust that they trust are going to get insurance and all that kind of stuff. They, they trust these people. That's why they hire them. But a, in a position where a director is only directing, they are hired. Well, but don't they pick their, don't they pick their department heads? They pick their department heads to the extent that those are creative departments. Let's say a director who has full creative control, like I did for, like I do for all the names we buried, but I do not have full business control. I, I share business control. And because I'm also a producer and have actually raised actual money and, am physically putting together this production because we're filming it in a place that I know and I have family. So I'm sharing business control, but I have full creative control. So every creative decision, it's ultimately my choice. There's discussions and there's push and pull, but there's a concession like, but you make the final decision creatively. But where there's a business choice, and we've even defined lead cast is both a creative and a business choice. Mm. And that's absolutely true. The, the single most valuable commodity in film is your lead actors. It's just a fact. 
um, because they drive the revenue for the film ultimately in the market. More than anything else, the actors drive it. Other things can drive it. So our lead cast is a shared decision, and we cast people that we all agree on. But hiring my cinematographer, you know, costume designer, production designer, those are my decisions. And then those people have creative ideas and visions for their department. And they, we, you know, and we have conversations and we come to a consensus. Ultimately, I have the final call, but I am looking for them to bring in, here's what I want to do. And after I've communicated, here's the movie I want to make. Here's the tone. Here's the vibe. Here's the conference. You know, here's the, the comps, the reference points. So we all want to make the same movie. They're like, yep, I get it. I love it. What if we did this with costume? What if we did this with production design? What if we did this with camera? And then it's my job to say yes, yes, no, no. A little like this. I don't think that's a good choice and here's why because X, Y, or Z. But then within those departments, there's obviously a lot of execution that has to happen. People that actually build the set, assemble the sets, uh, hold the camera, focus the camera, you know, changing the cards, uh, holding lights, setting up lights. You know, a lot of what we're describing, the job of the director, there are the directors who are established and their job is just picking the next project that they're going to be hired on to direct and they're going to execute it. I have a lot of interest, so there's other things that I still want to be doing, but, you know, I'm, I'm very far from being at a place where I'm just presented with opportunities for feature films I want to direct. So for me, and I would guess a lot of people like me and certainly people who might listen to this, I'm still a, a full-time freelance filmmaker. Like I'm, I'm supporting a family based on what I do. And that can look very different within a given year. Um, and a lot of it can be very mundane, very unsexy. I think about myself as a, you know, a, a project executor. Like I'm very project focused. Like I, a, any new project that I can kind of get a vision for how to create it and then have some control in that execution, that's very fulfilling, that satisfies all the same sort of, you know, hunger and appetite that directing a film and I say that because, you know, if I move into an office and I want to design the office space, I've got vision for how this should look, the lights I should get, the things I should put on my wall, the kind of furniture. That's a very fulfilling creative process for me. But also if I'm like, I haven't filmed all the names we buried yet, but I've spent a lot of time creating a deck, like a PDF document that helps communicate the production. There's stills. We, f we did a short teaser that we filmed and we have stills of images and, and creating that document was a very fulfilling creative process for me. And typically a director would hire a designer to do that. I happen to be able to do graphic design to an acceptable level. So I did my own decks. I designed that document in Photoshop, picking the fonts, communicating, you know, the message, the bullet points, the, the summaries. Uh, and and putting together that document is uh, a was a very fulfilling creative job for me. And I tell a lot of people certainly when you're a freelance director, you're pitching for jobs on a, on a commercial level. You're creating decks. A big part of the job of the director is making decks, PDF presentations of what you want to do that you're hopefully convincing an employer to hire you based off of. Or after you're hired, you're creating that document that then communicates. Like I said tone, vision. So if tone management, vision management is the job of the director, a deck is a really useful tool to do that because I can look at this document and I can see it. I can, oh, because I chose these photos or these stills from other movies or this type of, you know, uh, messaging, all of that communicates the vision. And so aside from shooting a little short version of what you want to make, which some people do and which I've done in the past, Creating these deck documents is a big part of being a director and and not just creating them, but making all the decisions that would lead to that document. One thing that you said earlier that you kind of, it was just like a, in passing, but I think that it's worth pointing out because number one, it's something that you have that I think is critical. My wife has it as well. And it's something that I uh, don't have naturally and I, I am striving to acquire. Finding joy in the execution of the mundane and the boring because my default has always been to chase the dopamine hit of the of the big breakthrough i feel like 
there is not enough creative weight attached to execution of the mundane. So I spent a lot of time, you know, within a given year making money, directing things that might be thought of as quote unquote mundane, like a three minute promotional video for a particular business. A good director can sort of, okay, I know exactly what you want and I know how to achieve it. And then you deliver them something that has been somewhat pro forma for you, but you're making a lot of creative decisions and your tastes. I mean, the best directors, if we talk about vision management and tone management, that means your tastes have to be really good. And so I think I'm a, someone hopefully with good taste. So the things I create, there's finesse. There's an artistry applied of, okay, I've, I've gotten these interviews. They've told me their story and I'm going to put it together in a way that's going to be deceptively simple, but just yet hopefully perfectly uh, encapsulate what they're going for with all this additional finesse of and touch of artistry. The best directors, if you're doing something mundane, you're not just enjoying the mundaneness for its own sake. You're finding the art in the mundane. You're finding those little glimmers of humanity. That first experience I had where I was just a director, it was a, it was a healthcare commercial for like a hospital in my town. And they had the script, they had the production company, they just needed a, a director, someone to come in and, and, you know, take the lead on the casting, who are the actors? Um, what are the locations going to look like? How are we going to, you know, shoot this on the day? And while there was really no creative fulfillment, I didn't really feel like and I didn't even oversee the edit. It then moved on to an editor. I was shown it after it was edited. And so it was like, I was very clear on what I was hired to do. And I was like, oh, cool. Looks great. Uh, here's, here's music that you might want to think. I was envisioning this song and they liked it. They're like, oh, cool. Yeah, let's use that song. Um, so it was something that I had real no attachment to. And I didn't even have any control over how it turned out. And that was a very fulfilling process because, you know, as a director, I was just there to serve the vision of the agency that hired me, the production company, and ultimately the marketing team of this healthcare company. And I did it well. It was, I was able to lead that set very well, create a good camaraderie, good atmosphere. I had a blast with my friends and when it was done, sort of moved on. And now, you know, what I would give to be in that environment again, to where I don't need, I don't have this burning, you know, passion necessarily to create and to control it. I'm happy to be hired to serve a greater vision to serve someone else. Correct me if I'm wrong. It, it feels like that's a little bit of that is maturity and growth. Exactly. I mean, there's part of it is our egos hopefully soften as we get older and we start to just not believe our own hype. And we sort of say, you know what, let's just, let's just do this as a team and I'll kind of steer the ship, but also the experiential wisdom of having done this so many times, I realize there's three outcomes of any given project. It's as I envisioned it, it's better than I envisioned it. It's worse than I envisioned it. It's one of those three things are going to happen. And there's no rhyme or reason. There's no consistency that I can point to where you're for sure going to know that it's one of those three. There's all these other crazy things that inevitably will happen that will surprise you. And only when it's done, do you have a sense of, yes, that was just as I envisioned it or the best. Yes, that was even better than I envisioned it, or the worst, and the by far the most common. Ah, it was just not quite what I envisioned it, but hopefully it's still passable. 80% of the time, it's the last one. It's not quite what I was envisioning, but, you know, it's still good enough. If I could have just done these things, and it would have been just like I planned, or, which is one of the reasons fair is my favorite thing, I had a bar for expectation and vision, and it surpassed it at every level, the experience, the, the final product. And you can't plan for any of that. And I've seen enough to where it doesn't matter. It's not the fact that I controlled one more than another where that happens. It's, it's much more random than that because it's all these other things. And often it's the times where I relinquish control and have let something happen, a happy accident or another idea that suddenly creates something and you get that product where it's better than I envisioned. So the more you do it, the more you realize that uh, it's not me having all of the control and just holding on to the whole thing with an iron grip. That's not going to get the product, the, the vision that I want. I cannot be a director because that idea that there is unquantifiable magic, that drives me crazy. <laughs> like, because I would, I, I, I mean, this is, it's essentially what I 
do is I'm like, let's take something unquantifiable, like a, a giant vat filled with cells and tens of thousands of different intermediates and molecular species. And I'm now I want to quantify it. And I'm going to tell you what's happening in there. The idea of that in the, in the filmatic sense of like, we're just going to steer the ship in this direction and we're going to do everything we can, but we can only really control 10 things out of the 20,000 that there are. And we just have to trust that everything is going to fall into the right place. That's maddening to me. And that's as a director, that's what I'm, I'm hoping for. I, at the end of the day, I want to create an environment where that magic can happen to where that thing can creep in. Maybe it's in during shooting, maybe it's during writing, or maybe it's during the edit. That the thing that I never expected that pushes it over the edge. That's the goal. That's sort of what you're aiming for in any project is what's the thing that might make this magical. You want to do Rex real quick? I do. Do you have a recommendation for our fine feathered f- friends? I do. My recommendation for this week would be a book that I just read called The Left Hand of Darkness. It's by uh, an amazing author. Her name is Ursula K. Le Guin. And it is a phenomenal book. It is science fiction, but science fiction in the way that a science fiction, someone who is not attuned to science fiction or into science fiction would still love it because it's really, it's about people. It's not. You don't have to like get into the technology like for something like The Martian, for example. Uh, it's very much a human story. And the basic setup is that it is, this is about a future society where we have developed interstellar uh, faster than light speed or near light speed travel. And there is now this federation of worlds. And I think there's like 84 or something and it's called the Ecumen. And they, anytime they find a new world of people, they are of higher life forms. They will go and recruit them to be part of this ecumen. They're not a government. They are a body that brings all of these different worlds together, but they self-govern. Anyway, they've recently discovered a new uh, inhabited world that they have named winter. It has a different name that obviously they call it themselves. And they have sent their first envoy and the envoy goes there and realizes that this is a world filled with genderless beings. Now they are not genderless all the time, They have a short period of time that is, you know, their like um, mating cycle that they call chimer. And during that time, they will, uh, they will assign, they will assign themselves to a gender. I think it's, it's something that they can choose, but it's also something that is somewhat dictated by the person that they are romantically involved with in that moment. If, if that person takes on a more male role, then the other person will take on a more female role and they will take take that on temporarily. It has these interesting implications like anyone in the society can get pregnant. So there's a lot more equality because you don't have a group of people uh, of half the population that are relegated to child care, you know, child birth rearing, right? And so everybody, there's a lot more support for that sort of thing. It has all these interesting social implications. Just a really fascinating exploration of the ideas of gender. The main character who is this envoy, and he is a man having to constantly disentangle his idea of political wranglings when the person is not a man or a woman. I'm like, how would he deal with a woman of power versus a man of power? What do you do when they don't have those characteristics? They're just a human of power. And they don't, you know, have these ideas that like, how do you manipulate a woman of power versus a a man of power? Well, you would, there are different things that you would think of. Anyway, strip that all away. And that's the story. Uh, I don't want, I won't get in too much because uh, the whole last half of the book was unexpected and beautiful, but highly recommended. The title is The Left Hand of Darkness. The author is Ursula K. Le Guin. 1969 is when she wrote this. Mm. Ursula K. Le Guin, she's actually a foundational science sci-fi writer. She, first female to ever win the Hugo and Nebula Awards, and then the first author to ever win both of them twice for a novel. Wow. The Left Hand of Darkness. Wonderful book. Ursula K. Le Guin. Read all our stuff. My recommendation is Panera. Get out of here. No, they have a new <laughs> program service called a coffee subscription. For eight ninety nine a month, you can get unlimited coffee. If you are used to buying a cup of Starbucks a couple times a week on your way to taking your kids to school like I would do, or even buying a few pounds of whole bean, which I, I also do, for eight ninety nine a month, 
you can save a lot of money. So I still buy whole bean and I still will grind usually now on the, just the weekends or someday where I'm like at home for the morning, I'll grind some nice coffee. But now I do this, uh, eight ninety nine a month subscription to Panera and I just drop Skylar off and go to Panera and get a cup of coffee. And for some reason, this is really why I'm recommending them. A new reward started showing up on the app of a free daily bagel. I didn't ask for it. I didn't recall seeing any promotion of it, but I, I, I get like free coffee and a free bagel like every day. It's like daily free bagel, redeem. And I was like, what is this madness? Three days in a row, I've just had a free bagel. I don't know what it's coming from, but eight ninety nine. I don't know how it'll last. I'm not questioning it. I'm just enjoying it. So Thank you start. for listening. Thank you for listening to episode four, Mr. Interruption Phase. Please, please help us grow our audience by subscribing to this podcast wherever you listen to yours. Yes, and thank you so much for all of the wonderful ratings and reviews so far. Uh, we appreciate all of your kind words. And if you want to stay in touch with us throughout the month, you can follow our Instagram account at Two Friends Pod. And get in touch with us at Two Friends with Podcast.com. We've got an email address there. Hey, at Two Friends with Podcast.com. We want to hear from you. Also, that website is where you can get the footnotes from this episode and links to the recommendations and anything else we might have discussed. And Thomas, I, I, it's hard for me to even imagine this scenario, but if people have not seen any of your film work, where, how, would, how do they find them? Thank you for asking, Justin. I really appreciate that. They can go to thomastory.com. Oh, and Justin, if people want to see our company, Bad Theology, where can they go? I don't know. Oh, actually, I don't know. They can go to badtheologypictures.com or follow us on Instagram at at theology and, and and if someone actually feels like they might want to get in touch with you have no idea why could they possibly do that on social media myspace okay linkedin linkedin yeah i'm on there we will be dropping episodes every other week give or take so keep up with us thank you as always for listening two friends two friends sorry let me, i'm gonna let my dog out of my office real sure. quick because he's gonna keep crying just give me a second Justin's gone, and his dog is crying. Two friends and a crying dog. Dot com.